Are we ready? Yeah. <gasps> <laughs> was that real or was that your hand? Uh, it's a little predator. Oh! <laughs> I'm on the sniffers, on the couch. I feel like it's such a treat to have you here physically yes, with me. In person, like that's it's right. so nice. Yes. It's so nice because it's not often that you guys are actually touched down here in Australia. We have the album. It is called Cartoon Darkness, album number three. Before we get into that, I want to know there's been so much when I think about Comfort to Me, your last album that drops, the fact that a lot of the press around that time was Zoom interviews. Now this one, you're actually kind of on the ground. There's more hope around it as well. You know that you're going to be doing shows around this record. What's been your energy going into this new album cycle? I, I, it's nice. It's nice not having to do Zoom interviews all the time. I remember in lockdown, like, that was terrible. That was the worst thing to come out of lockdown is all the Zoom press. <laughs> yeah, we are on so many Zooms, like, staring at computers and all that stuff. And so it's, it's nice to actually just be talking to people and seeing people. And, yeah, we've been touring the last album for, like, three years, basically. So getting all of our music in front of people and seeing the live audiences. It feels a lot better coming into this album. I still feel like it's like the unknown that we had for the last album still feels like with this album, I probably feel like that'll be how just albums feel. Mm. Like you're just not sure what, how they'll be received or what will happen on the other side of it. Because it's always less of an avalanche and more of like a lot of different things that add up to the whole album cycle mm. and the album release and how people enjoy it or don't enjoy it. Yeah. How long have some of these songs been in the making like Chewing Gum, You Should Not Be Doing That was written in the first half of last year. I guess by the time the album comes out, they'll be like 18 months old. No, 12 months old, something like that. Yes, yeah, some of them are super different. Like, because we wrote like, we probably wrote like 30 skeletons of songs or more. And like some of them were dog shit. And then other times we kept them and then they became the album. So some of them are super new. Like we wrote only in May this year, but then other songs were kind of like fetal last year. So yeah. Yeah. Musically, this is probably the most diverse territory for Amel and the Sniffers, I would say. I want to know, when you are making those skeletons, what's the process like? When are your lyrics coming into it? Where, how does it all begin for an Amel and the Sniffers track? Usually the boys do first. Like for this, every cycle's been different, but this time like the boys would go in during the day and they would just write stuff and then they will do demos and then I would come in during the night and listen to the demos and write by myself because we started doing it all together and I was like, I don't feel like doing this. Not because I don't like them, just because for some reason I was like, I don't know if this will work this time. Maybe because it was so loud and I couldn't hear myself and I really wanted to make sure I played this album instead of just like yelling the whole time, but I can't not yell if it's so super loud with what they're doing. Oh. Plus I felt like the privacy of being able to think alone and express myself alone meant I could play with things a bit more, experiment a bit more, rather than having them play it over and over and over again while I figured my stuff out. Wow. Yeah. Do you find that maybe your lyrics can be more personal, doing it kind of off to, your, off to the side on your own? Maybe, but I also think this album isn't, um, it's not as personal as other albums or Agreed. other songs. I feel like it's more, not. I wouldn't say generic, but it's less like me being like, and then I woke up and I was sad, even though I do say good morning. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and it's more kind of like my way of trying to process the world, especially because I feel like there's so much going on in the world and I just really want to try and understand it rather than shy away from it. So I feel like it's less internal and more external. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to revisit the early days because you living together or living in close quarters is something that you're no strangers to, obviously. You all live together and that's when you decided to create the band, right? Is there something that, you know, you look back on eight, nine years later that now, Amy, because initially you just thought, we just want to play house parties, we want to have fun. Yeah. Looking at where you are now, what surprised you about the guys, you know, from living together in that share house to now touring the world, being in L.A., three records in? Well, I think anything you could guess or predict is just true. Like, <laughs> you live with three dudes like this, everything you imagine, <laughs> I can confirm. <laughs> you don't need the fart machine. No, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Machine. yeah he's, <laughs> he can do the real thing. <laughs> They often, and they're very proud of it. So. Um, no, well, what am I surprised? I just think it's really cool for me getting to see everybody grow up. Yeah. Um, like, because uh, I think it's really special to have friendships that last this long. Like, we've known each other now for, yeah, like, I guess nine years, and we've spent so much time together over that nine years. Same with 
like Briar, same with Gus. So mm. just seeing how we've all grown up and how we're all changing and just letting like sharing this experience together is pretty special because I know like some solo artists that I know they struggle to be during the world or experiencing all this stuff alone, whereas yeah. we're super lucky that we do get to experience it all together. And, yeah, some of them are kind of clean and some of them are getting cleaner, like, in their living quarters. But now <laughs> that we're bigger, we don't have to share beds and hotel rooms. Oh, so isn't that nice? That's pretty good for me. Yeah. yeah. Declan, what about you looking back on that time maybe with Amy, with Amy. or with the guys? Yeah, I think it's it's actually amazing because, I th- like, when I was thinking about it then, like, Amy is – quite similar to what you were like you have grown i think but like this amy's always had this uh amazing admirable level of professionalism Mm. that she has you know she had at a very infant stages in the band and and now it's like you know you know we're living overseas and amy's a i guess world superstar or whatever (laughs) you know I don't get invited to the celeb parties. No, you could come. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. You can I, plus one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you want to come, you can but, um, message me. Yeah, as well, like I've also noticed like as a person, Amy's grown and, you know, a lot of compassion, which she always has, but she's been really had the time to expand on that as well and a very patient person too, which is really nice. Me? Patient? <laughs> really? I don't feel patient. <laughs> really? Um, no, no. I'm busy, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it about each other that made you go, yeah, let's let's F around and find out and start a band together? Well, I think like everyone around us was kind of doing the same thing really, you know. I think in in every city in Australia there's like a bunch of, you know, young people who are just going to gigs all the time who think, hey, we can be a band. So we sort of replicated what we saw other people doing. Mm. Um and then, yeah, I mean, the thing that kind of made it unique for us is that we did live together and we were like, let's be the house party band. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, like I feel like we were less like, oh, let's start a band and let's like, and more like, let's like make music in some capacity. <laughs> like it was less any kind of concept of going like, oh, we'll be a band and we'll have a name and we'll put stuff online and which we did all of that, but we just thought, well, we'll just play music and the music kind of was kind of first really. Hmm. Yeah. You did your first EP, you recorded it in an afternoon. Some of the songs were written on the fly. You chucked it up on Bandcamp. How do you think you've maintained some of that essence and taken it into this third record, which has, you know, made it a pretty special place, which we'll talk about in a tick? Um, well, we were doing like the pre-production for this album, like what, two of the songs were written in that time. So there's still like an element of spontaneity in our writing process. I've always found that like, we're sort of one of those bands that tries to go for a feeling rather than like a thought, I guess, with our music. So we, we're sort of always pursuing that that feeling of like excitement and spontaneity and maybe rough around the edges, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, I think it's all the spirit. Like it's just inherently in us. Like I don't know what it is, but it's just what comes out. Like even Jerk and um, that song was written like I was like hadn't written the lyrics for it yet. Everyone had gone home except for like me and a couple of people at the studio. I was like, ah, oh, stuff it. I'll have a couple alcoholic seltzers. Did yeah. had two drinks and then just recorded three takes, and that was basically it. I'm so so glad. it's like that spontaneous. I feel like you know sometimes the things that aren't thought about too much are are just like they got beauty in them. I guess. Mm. Yeah. Tell us about the studio where you recorded this one because at this desk we've gotten some epics. We've gotten Nirvana's Nevermind. We've gotten Fleetwood Mac's Rumors. What was this studio like and how could you feel the music royalty around you? Um, I mean, it's pretty like right in your face. Like this console is signed by like Paul McCartney and Stevie Nicks, Carl Perkins. I'm pretty sure Lars Ulrich too. And you're like, you know, this is what they were done with. And, you know, they've got, you know, blah, 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 spilt their illicit substances on this desk, you know. Never cleaned? Uh, I'm sure someone's cleaned it. If not, you know, I would have. That was a sponge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Like it, uh, yeah, I guess we could feel the magic. But I think like in this in this period that we had in there, we were very like just focused on our own thing as well. Yeah. I think as well for me, I was like, well, if all these great albums have been written on it and what we make is crap, then it's definitely our fault. Oh, yeah. So I was like, <laughs> oh, shit, you know. <laughs> like it's all on us? It's all on us. Yeah. yeah, this is on us, yeah. 606 Studios in LA, Foo Fighters own this one. You recorded it with Nick Launay. What was it like working with Nick and taking these tracks to him? Well, yeah, Nick, we've known for a while. He, he mixed um, Comfort to Me. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, like he sort of was able to understand 
where we've come from as an Australian band, which is really important to us, working with like Minard Oil and In Excess and Silverchair. You know, it was a fun process working with him. Um, he kind of understands Australians, he lives here. He kind of understood, I guess, like, I don't know, but he understood what we were trying to go for, I yeah. guess. Was there anything with him, you know, looking back at Comfort to Me, going into this album, you went, we are not doing that again. Or I liked that. Let's let's well, kind of he, replicate it. He mixed Comfort to Me and we did that like separately. So we were in Australia and he was in LA and the time differences were crazy. And I think it was, that was just like, we'll never do that again because it was annoying as hell. Uh, so this time we were like, we'll just make sure we're in the same city when we're mixing it. Um, and honestly, working with the producers, you got to trust them a lot because you're giving them mm. the thing. And like, I'm a control freak because I'm protecting it. I want to protect what's sacred to what's ours. But it was good that we'd kind of work with him before so we could, like, trust him a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The album opens with Jerkin. Yeah. Why did you want to open the record with this? Yeah, we just thought it'd be fun to start the album with You're a Dumb Cunt, <laughs> uh, You're an Arsehole, all of that stuff because it's a good way to kind of, like, establish the boundaries and go, like, look, if you don't like some of his songs, it's okay. That first song's for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also... um, yeah, I don't know. I just it just feels right. It feels like kind of like old animal versus like Beastie Boys. Like I feel like it's our spirit in a lot of ways. So yeah. just coming in with a with a bang. Something that's really interesting, and I don't know if it's just my use of the internet, but I feel like this album is a real comment on how we engage with the internet, even since 2021, like even since Comfort to Me. Yeah. And I love in this song how you talk about these losers online who in the, you just think, you're obsessed with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? You say something really great in there as well about how they like on my outfits but then hate my success. Yeah. Tell me about, you know, those kind of lines and why you wanted to bring that into this track. Uh, I think coming from the heavier music scene, it's a very critical and very judgmental scene. And I think that's a beautiful thing because it creates, um, it creates like people needing to work more to push through that. Mm. But I think like as an ambitious band and people who want to explore all different kinds of genres, I feel like there's a lot of people who just don't want bands to explore and they don't want bands to be creative. They want bands to be in the same position that they were when they first fell in love with them. But I feel like I don't. I just want to be accepted and appreciated for what I am and how I am rather than to be this idealised version of myself. I don't want to have to cosplay an old version of myself. I always want to change, mm. always want to grow, always want to explore. I also think that like everybody is online and everybody is socially engaging online and it's like it's such a big part of our lives right now like we're basically an extension we like basically have this little extra robot mm. in this half real half fake world and I think people I don't know I just think it's like a lot of people still use that to criticize people mm -hmm. and I've never done that really I'm, I'm sure I've like dipped my toes in but I think everybody gives those people too much of a voice when really that's a really unhealthy thing to do. It's really toxic. It's like I can't imagine anybody sitting down there and typing abuse at people mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of just poking fun at that because it's, I don't know, it's a problem but it's also not a problem and it's a lighthearted thing. I'm saying like, oh, you like my outfits and you're like constantly looking at my shit, constantly ragging on me, constantly commenting on my posts but like – but you're criticising me because I actually think you might be, like, jealous or something. So totally. just admit that, Bella. And especially, like, people who are really – the world's super conservative still, especially in the way that people dress and express themselves, which is a really basic and shallow thing that people should have moved through already. Mm. But they haven't moved through it yet. They still find, like, you know, women who wear skimpy clothes threatening or, assault, like, insulting. And so as somebody who wears – is a scantily clad lady – I'm just kind of saying, like, you you like what I'm wearing because yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. I see what you're saying about what I'm wearing, but you don't like what I'm doing or what music I'm making, and it's just ironic, I think. so. And I think you tap into that as well. Skip forward a couple of tracks. we got Tiny Bikini. Tiny Bikini. It is a song about wearing a tiny bikini. Tiny bikini. Yeah, I exactly. love it. Yeah. yeah. That's one of my favourite songs, actually, because as well, it's like the spaces that I exist in are super male-dominated still, right? Mm. And, like, you know, a lot of the time it's technically my space because it's like the Animal and the Sniffers show or the Animal and the Sniffers, like, recording room even, whatever it is. Mm. But I'm still the only one femininely dressed and a lot of people think it's for them or still think, like, oh, you know, that it's, like, hummer, hummer. But I'm like, no, I'm doing this to be spicy, to make the world more interesting because yeah. the world is boring and we're going to die <laughs> and I just want to look fun while I'm here. I feel like the record is that. We hear that especially on Chewing Gum. <laughs> 
I think the rent was due when you made this album because the guitar solos on this record are so good. Thank like you. when I was going through, I'm looking, I was like, melting guitar solo, like amazing. Yeah. Seriously. You. Do you think touring relentlessly has kind of aided your technicality? Because um, they've always, the solos have always been there, but they were just really like quite ravishing across the record and really just came to the front of the mix, you know? I don't know, maybe I, I just had like a little bit more time, I guess, to, <laughs> <laughs> on, on this record. Um, some some solos were like improvised and, and, you know, I just told Nick to just chuck them in there. I liked them and some were like, you know, written and overdubbed and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I think it's interesting that you, you say that because, I don't know, I kind of didn't really put much thought. The solo for me almost comes last where I'm like, whatever, just put something there. An embellishment, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You didn't put thought into it, but I seen you in the studio and you it was all like, you were just like having a lot of fun with it, I think. Yeah. That's why. Like, His sheep like, is. Yeah. Look at him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, I don't know. Really? Yeah, so I, I know. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what I wanted. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the songs that's going to surprise people on the record is Big Dreams. Year it feels like this rally cry. We've got you in this kind of low, melodic voice, but it also feels like there's camaraderie with this song as well. Tell us a bit more about that. Spaghetti Western. I want it to feel like a spaghetti Western. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, me and Declan wrote that, just us two, and there was heaps of reverb on his guitar and there was heaps of reverb on my voice and there was no other instruments around, so it was really easy to sing it instead of yell it because, mm. again, usually if all the instruments are there, it's loud, I'm yelling. Um, and so it came out super soft and chill and really kind of, like, fun. And when we just took two little demos of it on my phone, I was like, I actually just like it simple. Like, let's try and keep it just, like, stripped back and simple, like a bit of a different vibe. Um it's a scary one to put out because it is so different. So I know that it'll be polarizing to a lot of people who already love us. But personally, like, I feel like it's kind of a homage. Homage. I was like, a homage. <laughs> homage? Yeah, <laughs> homage yeah, yeah. Yes. A homage to like someone like Crowded House or something like that, which is a bit more chill and a bit more like, yeah, singing kind of um, singing style rock music instead yeah. of the full assault of which I love both of them. But, yeah, this song to me is just about all the people in my life who, like, are just, they have all these talents and when you see them doing what they're doing, they're so amazing. Like, they've always been lit. They've never been dull. And I feel like after especially, like, the pandemic and stuff, people's lives really got slowed down and derailed and um, things that we haven't and to date worked out for a lot of people the way that they've hoped, but I just really believe in them. And I'm like, mm. when I, you do your thing, it doesn't matter if you've made money. It doesn't matter if you've um, had all the dreams that you thought would happen because your talent makes you so lit and amazing. And like, you've always been amazing and like, there's no one like you. So in an oversaturated world with people that are successful, it's kind of a song for people that their big dreams haven't come true yet, but it's what they give to the world that is beautiful. Yeah. It feels like a coming of age song, but at any age, Yeah, you know, and even just that notion of leaving a small town or leaving a place that's constricting you. Yeah. I kind of felt like listening to it. I was like, yeah, you can do that at any age. Yeah. yeah. Cause it's actually is for adults. Like it was the way that I felt a lot of ways being in like Melbourne slash Nam. Like yeah. I was like, I feel, I feel not good here anymore. I yeah. have to like, I want to get out of here. I feel suffocated here. I need change, you know. And it took a really long time for me to be able to do that. Like I wanted to leave for like maybe a year and a half, but it mm. just, it takes time to do that and get yourself going. And yeah, I feel like it's a song about just going for it. And that, that line, like another birthday, another year older, that is for people who it's like, you know, a lot of people, they're changing into a different period of their life. It's like whether it be from their 20s to their 30s or like mid-30s and it's like we are all getting older mm -hmm. and I still, that I think we're all young as hell. Like I think y everyone's young until they're like 89 or something. Can even <laughs> then, but like it's like your life's still young. You yeah. can make changes. It's not like it's not the funeral home yet. You're not geriatric. Like get out there and do it, Yeah, whatever it is. Declan, what about you? Did you kind of feel that sentiment as well? Yeah. I mean like it's an interesting sort of process where um you know when you're focusing on the music that i don't really pay attention to amy's lyrics until quite late you know what i mean <laughs> they don't know what i'm saying they yeah. don't hear back the song they're like oh is that what you said yeah is that what you said i mean to be honest like you know i don't even know what some of the lyrics are on the first album <laughs> unless i have to sing them i don't know you know i'm that i'm that focused on all these great guitar solos yeah. you know <laughs> so and you know i can't have words coming into my head during that but yeah no i, I think like 
yeah, it's it's what I was saying before. Is like that was sort of a song that like it was soft. We needed to find a way to grow it, and I needed to find a way for Bryce and Gus to have a, a part of it as well. Mm. Yeah, because there was no way I could have let the song just be me and Amy yeah. on the album. That would have been awkward, you know. The good drink break for the boys. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They can chill out. Can yeah, chill out. Oh, yeah. have a whiz. Totally. Yeah. It's mine. Is a highlight. So punk made for the stage. At this point in your career, how much are you writing a track for an album knowing it's going to kill life? Yeah, I feel like we only kind of used to do that, like, because we hadn't had enough songs, so we're like, we need more songs so we can keep mm. playing live, because the set's over in 20 minutes, so yeah. it was all about getting more of that out. Um, whereas this album, I feel like I definitely heard Declan and Bryce saying they wanted it to be more studio, like, less thought about in terms of, like, how will we play this live, how will it be executed, and how will the fans appreciate it live, and more like, what will it sound like recorded, because mm. that was a challenge for them, I think, yeah. to do that. Yeah, like we, you know, we knew no matter what we do on this album, we can fill an hour already live, which is like the biggest <laughs> stress for us, you know, with these contracts on these festivals telling us that we've got to play for 60 minutes. So we sort of had this, um, yeah, this luxury to just be like, you know, doesn't matter how it comes across live. We already have our live set, so we can just do whatever we want. Wow. Is there a freedom in that? Um. Probably not, actually. Mm. No, it's kind of like, yeah, because, you know, we did have to sort of explore some things that we haven't done before and go softer than we've done before. And because there was nothing to reference, like, we haven't done it before, you don't know if you're making a mistake. Mm. You don't know if people will hate it. You know, it's like other people are really good at writing soft songs, like, are we? You know, have we just written, like, you know, the worst soft song ever? We don't know. <laughs> I also love that your version of a soft song, like, you know, we refer yeah. to one, it's like got full rallying cries in yeah. it, you know what I yeah. mean? Like, they're not they're not soft ballads, you know, yeah. it's, it's okay. I think one of the more razzing songs on the record would be Motorbike Song. And I think your lyrics across this record, Amy, I feel like there is some use of like straight up lyrics, but also double entendre. It's out there, but then also it's quite poetic. I know that in your 20s, you got really into reading and books have any books kind of influenced your writing on this record? Ooh, let me think. Um, I can't pinpoint a specific book, but yes, I love reading now. Like highly recommend it to anyone who doesn't do it. But um, it's just like pure escapism and fantasy from the world while also learning around about the world. I mean, I'm not selling books here, but... <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, now's the time. And, and books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> um, no, there's not been a particular book that I would say has influenced this, but the motorbike song for me... Um, I don't know, I feel like maybe this time in my life I I have felt super suffocated in specific areas and, like, that's why it's not super vulnerable is because I don't feel like I'm in touch with a lot of things in, about myself. Uh, but I feel like with this song it's kind of like the feeling I want to embody a motorbike on a highway, like I want to mm. be the bike. I want that, like, I saw one driving past the car, I was like, I just want to be that bike, like driving along the highway at night and like free as hell, air all over it, just like a little rebel just on that road. Like, mm. and I just want that song to feel like it because I feel like as well, like in society, like a lot of people just aren't very free. Like, um, you know, it's like they're working all day and they have no time for their friends and family. And, you know, there's so many tasks that everyone has to look after. Like you got to clean the house, you got to bloody, I don't know, post on Instagram, you got to check in with your friends online, you got to go to work, you got to like cut your toenails. It's like you're busy. Yeah. And it's exhausting and I just want that freedom of like a bike with no obligations. Yeah. You're like, if you're going to be a machine, at least be a motorbike. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I love that. A song that you thought on the record that was going to be horny was Bailing On Me. Yeah. How did you know that? I mean, f honey, I read. <laughs> I know what's going on. Why? And, and okay, I'll let you guys tell the story. So you initially took it to the band. You said, I think this one's going to be a little bit racy. I think this is going to be, you know, and then Amy, you went, nah. This one's going to be sad. And when we talk about some of the more, I guess, softer tracks on the record, yeah. this is one of them. Yeah, well, the, the I mean, it was, it was yeah, I've, I kind of wrote it in a lusty moment, you know. It's just me and my guitar in bed. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and, you know, that's kind of, yeah, that was where it came from. So, you know, when, when I came up with it, I was like, this is where it is. And I guess with it being like a sort of riff that, we haven't done before. Amy was like, "What? What's the idea here? What do you feel?" And I was like, "Well, it's horny." 
<laughs> I was like, I beg to differ. Yeah. <laughs> what did you think it's when you heard it? Bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I heard it, I was like, okay, okay, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but Declan really loved it. And I was like, well, I love Declan, so I'll make it work for him. Because <laughs> I don't want to dismiss anybody's song if they love it. So I'll, yeah. say, I'll definitely put some time into this. And I was kind of stuck on it because, again, it was different to what I was used to writing. Um, and then I was like, Declan, you know, what do you think? He's like, oh, I think it should be sexy, like a bit of a, you know, yeah, horny number. And I was like, I tried. I was like, it doesn't work for me like that. So to me, because I feel like a lot of the time the music kind of like it, it's, it's already saying something. I'm just trying to translate it. And mm. to me it was translating into like a heartbreak song rather than like a sexy song. So, mm. yeah. I really like that the heartbreak of it all is so relatable though because it is called Bailing On Me and I just – felt it like I swear when someone is pulling away from you you just know yeah. like you can just feel it and it is about that it's not necessarily yeah. you know you say that you're heartbroken in it but it is that premise of just like I can feel this thing is getting stale like it's yeah. rotting right in front of me it's the exhaustion of going like oh damn I know yeah. what this is you know Deck how did you feel seeing the way that song transformed I mean, I was I was fine with it. I don't know how I should interpret that if I hear horny and Amy hear sad. I, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I know that's kind of tragic. I for feel me, like that's the female You're experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> lay down, tell us all about it. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah um, but no, I like I was I was really passionate. I think it's probably my favorite song on the album. So wow. yeah, so I really enjoy this riff, and I really enjoy. So I just was really encouraging for Amy. I was like, you know. I was like, you know, if you hear heartbreak, let's go for it. Yeah. Um, you know, we we did all sorts of different ideas for it. I think, you know, we were even talking about duetting at one point and stuff. Like, I was just like, whatever it is that you need to do to this song, you know, make it happen because I really want it to be on the album. Hell yeah. Amy, do you have a favourite song on the album? Ooh. Um, doing In My Head is one, Me and the Girls is one, and Tiny Bikini is definitely one. Hell yeah. Aside from Chewing Gum, which yeah. is my... Creme de la creme. Doing In Your Head is where we get the album title Cartoon Darkness. And yeah. I think if we're going to talk about the themes of the record, this totally encompasses it. Tell me about this track and, and how you think it encompasses the record. Yeah, so the album name is Cartoon Darkness, which comes from a lyric from this song. But to me, this is kind of my like my viewpoint of the world right now. Like mm. I really feel like we are in dystopia currently. Like I don't think it's something in the future that is hypothetically going to happen one day. I think we're like right there smack bang in the middle of it. Uh, I feel like it's a, you know, that saying like frog in a pot or whatever, where it's like the frog's in the pot of water and it's boiling slowly oh, yeah. and it doesn't realize what's happening. I feel like that's kind of like where we are at right now. And I think like this song speaks to me about that in lots of ways. So it says like driving headfirst into cartoon darkness, which I think like, I don't know about you, but growing up, it's like we all, we've always heard like, oh, climate change is coming and like, you know, scientists have been like, oh, you guys should do something. And everyone's like, mm, well, probably not. <laughs> and so it's like, you know, we're kind of driving headfirst into this unknown. Like I feel like the stability and the familiarity of society as we know it, like even with capitalism and stuff, it's kind of like I don't really know what the future will foresee. Mm. And it feels pretty dark. It doesn't feel like I can see into like the future and, and I feel like relatively nihilistic but also I can't appreciate being nihilistic because there's too much work to do as a society like we can't just throw caution to the wind necessarily we're kind of like oh we, got, we have to do something mm, and mm -hmm. no one knows what to do and like it's I guess this song is kind of expressing that so even though the future is dark it's also cartoon and it's a fantasy and it's like it's colorful and it's beautiful and any kind of future is I'm excited by even if it is different and it's just talking about how like the way we express ourselves is through our like phones and, and social media and, and social media favors outrage. So the more negative comments, the more traction, the more attention it gets, which is super toxic for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also is just this data beast that collects our data. Um, so yeah, not to be like conspiracy theory, but this, I feel like the world as we know it is, it's becoming less and less transparent, all the kind of corruption that's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I feel like this song is my expression of that. And so even though the album is really fun and I really, really want it to be really fun, I didn't want the album to be like, I'm ignoring everything that's bad and mm. it's fun. I want it to be like, everything is really crazy and really bad, but I still value fun and I don't want to mourn what we already have right now as gone because it's 
a lot of things are still here and all of this heartbreak of being alive comes from loving stuff. Like we love little birds and we love like like chocolate caramel iced lattes. It's like <laughs> yummy. And like I just think it's from we all care about it. That's why everyone gets so worried and stressed. And so this song is kind of like the way of trying to figure all that out. Totally. And also knowing where to funnel that stress. I love the line in the song where you say, yeah, data brightens up my screen. The outrage connects big tech. Yeah. Even I think that sometimes when I'm just, there's so much of me in my job where I go, I've got to upload content. Yeah. And then when I get too deep into it, I'm like, but why do I need to upload it? Yeah. And who's on those sites? And, you know, even just scrolling through TikTok and finding my blood pressure literally rising from a video of a kid in a shopping centre interviewing people. And then I think, no, he wants you to get angry, Lucy, because then you comment and then more people go there. Like, it is just this cyclical thing, isn't it? Yeah, mm. and it's super weird. And, like, I feel like it's super interesting that, like, you know, technology is binaries. It's zero one zero one zero one. That's how it functions. And humans are non-binary, like, in many forms, not just gender, but in like non non-binary in thinking and nuanced. And social media is kind of like the connection between human world and the technology world. And it's funny, I think it's really interesting that we're trying to like process it in binaries by like removing nuance. Mm. And I think it's really interesting that that's how we react. And like I really don't have any answers for any of it. And like I feel like I'm definitely just another tire on the tire fire. But like I just think it's interesting and I'd like I love when people talk about it because it is like, yeah, this is weird. Mm. And I don't really understand it. And like yes, I'm uploading a photo of my like new shoes, but what does it mean? Because <laughs> <laughs> I want to upload the show the, the shoes. The yes. Shoes. yes. Uh, <laughs> So we're talking about these cycles, the nihilism of this record, but also across it, I do get this feeling of hope. We hear that in going somewhere. You know, you're talking about you're going somewhere, I'm going somewhere. How do you think this track kind of reflects that looking ahead and looking forward? Um, I think it's just my outlook on life. Like even if the whole world does go to like like craziness, I think it's still kind of exciting. Like there's always humans are adaptable and our behavior is adaptable. We always find a way to like have fun with stuff or like enjoy stuff, even if it's terrible. So I, I'm excited by that. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited by any kind of future. Like if anyone's going anywhere at all, that's exciting. If anyone is doing anything at all, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, it's just about, I do believe in the future. And like, you know, even if all the humans get like wiped off the earth there's probably some little crustacean on the bottom right now that's just waiting for the world to heat up so it can come up to the top and just grow so <laughs> that's yeah. such a good way of looking at it yeah. final track me and the girls yeah do you remember that kids show girl stuff boy stuff yeah, yeah. i feel like this is the modern day version of that <laughs> but the boys get the shit end of the stick yeah there is something on this song that i think we've not heard at all in the Al amal and the sniffers discography yeah. what's the vocoder yeah well, so what happened was me and Amy were bouncing ideas off for the chorus because we, yeah, we, we wrote that in, in the studio and he's like, I don't know what to do. And I don't know, I think, did I come up with the whole chorus? Yeah, I was like, hey, Declan, let's come up with a chorus together. I was like, let's do it. Let it. And so I was just saying like, me and the girls are drunk at the airport. And yeah. then he was like, I can't believe it. It's open bar. <laughs> And I loved it. I was like, this is it. This yeah. is the best. And uh, you, you, the reaction was like, you were in stitches. I was like, this is it. This and then song. next thing Amy's like, go do it. And so like I did it and it, it, sound, it ended up sounding like Boney M, you know, like, Which you're I crazy love. like a fool. <laughs> it sounded like that. Daddy cool. And so, yeah, when, when the song was finished, we were like, oh, like, I don't know, is it too Boney M -y? I mean, some people thought it was too Boney I loved it. Declan really liked it, but some people... No names, names. We're like, mm, this. Are they not here with us right They're now? They're not here with us right now. <laughs> At all. <laughs> Anymore. We got rid of them. Cut from the payroll. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, they just were like, this is silly. Yeah. Uh, and we we're like, well, mm. I'll show you silly. And let's add a vocoder. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we sort of, I guess that's, that's like leaning into it, I guess. And like, you know, Beastie Boys has kind of been a really big influence for us on this album. Yeah. Um, so we did the whole intergalactic voice thing. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think you wanted to close the record with this track? Uh, honestly, it was going to be vinyl only. We we're going to do it as like a secret bonus track. So we're like, let's oh. put it on the end, not tell anyone. And then they're like, what the hell is this? But then by the time the album was to be uploaded digitally, we were like, oh, nah, 
Let's crank this. Yeah. Yeah. Let's commit it to Let's the record. Commit it. Yeah, yeah, it's fun as hell. Me and the girls, yeah. And that's just a song because, again, it's a, it's a male-dominated da- world. So I was like, you know what? This is just a fun song for the girls. Like yeah. I can imagine some girls on some kind of girl trip and they're getting a $1,800 <laughs> margarita at some airport and they're like, let's get drunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Deck, how do you feel hearing some of the lyrics in this track about the boys? I love it. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. No, I love it big time. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, this is it's kind of ridiculous, but I mean, it's, you know, there, there's like so much humor in the lyrics, but like the court when the chorus comes in, me and the girls are drunk at the airport. I get like emotional. You're one of the girls as I, well, yeah. I guess so. Yeah, I'm the robot that gets invited along to yeah, the yeah. to the airport now. Yeah. So you spend a lot of time at airports. Oh yeah. Drunk at the airport to close. What is your airport bevy of choice? Oh, now I just have Coke Zeros everywhere. <laughs> Soda waters. Yeah. Yep. What did I, I? I once had espresso martinis once before a flight to. Ooh. Italy, that was a bad idea. I just oh. got excited because they were free. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then next thing, uh, I almost had to be like strapped down on my chair because I had three of them. <laughs> oh my God, too much. <laughs> Lucy, give me a me? Prosecco and I'm off. Yes, yeah. uh, honestly. Classy, I'm at the airport, classy girl. Classy, classy woman. Classy girl, what are you drinking? What am I having? Maybe a mimosa. Oh, mm. Lucy, she's got to do it. <laughs> Cheers, babe. Honestly, the record is out now. It's called Cartoon Darkness. I'm on the sniffers. Declan, Amy, thank you so much for hanging out. And congratulations. Yeah, thanks for having us.